Hello and welcome to the month of October. As we all know, this is the spookiest time of year. The time of year when all the ghouls and monsters come out to devour unhealthy sweets that we are required to purchase in abundance. Back when I was younger, the Halloween season was one of my favorite times of the year. The candy was nice, but I always loved dressing up as different things. I also loved the general festivity of the month. It truly felt like one big celebration every year. But one thing that always kept me in the Halloween spirit was the amount of holiday specials that would air in each of my favorite cartoons. Nothing reminded me what month it was more than Nickelodeon when the special episodes of SpongeBob, Jimmy Neutron, The Fairly Odd Parents, and others started to feel a lot more spooky. What was unfortunate was that every so often I would miss a Halloween special, then I wouldn't be able to see it again for at least another year. I will admit, it took me a long time to see the popular Spongebob Halloween special. It seems to be a trend of mine that I don't see Spongebob episodes until long after they first aired. But unlike the episodes on TV, it was impossible for me to miss the games that would be posted on Nickelodeon's website. Like with the shows themselves, Nickelodeon had holiday-themed games that were always amusing to play through. I thought we could start the month right by checking out some of the ones that were made for the show SpongeBob SquarePants. We are overdue for a SpongeBob video, after all. Nicktoons Basketball doesn't count. That was a crossover. So let's check out some of these SpongeBob Halloween games. This first one is unique because it's actually a two-parter. That was rare to see on Nick.com, so one could assume they meant business with this one. This was made by Sarbakin Game Studio, a well-established company that made many Flash games and apps for different TV shows. They're highly respected and have even won awards for games such as Where's My Water. Fans of Spongebob might recognize them for the Nick Arcade board game adaptations, such as the Game of Life, Monopoly, and the Truth or Square Party game. These developers often know what they're doing, so we should be in good hands with this game. Just as long as this one isn't loaded with button mashing minigames, my fingers still haven't recovered. So this game is interesting because we're at the menu screen and I'm already confused. The big words indicate that the true title is Halloween Horror and the subtitle is Frank and Bob's Quest. This could infer that there would be more games under the Halloween Horror umbrella, but this and its sequel were the only ones that ever came of it. According to the instructions, everyone in Bikini Bottom is transforming into some kind of monster. Hate it when that happens. The world around them is also taking on a more ghastly approach with sunken ships and graveyards popping up everywhere. Quite a respectable metaphor for the direction society is moving in. The controls are mostly straightforward, with the only somewhat strange one being the Z key for your special attack. Just position your fingers accordingly and it shouldn't be too bad. So you're Frankenbob, a Spongebob version of the Frankenstein monster. Fun fact, it was actually the scientist that was named Spongebob, not the sponge. So as Frank and Bob, you fight other fish that have been transformed into monsters by throwing nails at them. I'm not sure how Spongebob retained his sanity while the others have turned murderous, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and say it's due to his youthful optimism. You also walk with your arms stretched out in front of you. For a nice bit of trivia, this walk was popularized in the movie Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman, also known as the movie where the monster was played by Bela Lugosi, famous for playing Dracula in the 1931 movie. In Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman, the monster was blind and needed to walk with its arms outstretched. Ever since then, people have interpreted Frankenstein's monster with that attribute. Bela Lugosi also popularized the typical accent associated with Dracula and vampires as a whole. So you gotta hand it to him for forever changing the way people view two of the biggest horror icons of all time. What's neat is that whenever you take a hit from an enemy, part of your skeleton starts to show. Morbid, but cool. How many Spongebob games exist where you lose your skin as you go? You also collect jellyfish, which is a change of pace because I'm used to jellyfish hurting you in most Spongebob games. The worst enemies are these triplets that fly at you in three different angles. It's hard to hit them or jump over them. They always hit me before I hit them. Also, look at this. Are you seriously telling me I can't fit through that? Maybe a few hairs on my head are too tall to make it through. Your special move is this green glob you throw in an arch shape. It isn't much better than the nails, so it isn't entirely worth using. These cool jellyfish lamps also act as checkpoints. It's also nice that you can break through certain dirt walls to continue or find secret passages, but be careful with the order you smash the dirt or you just might corner yourself. 
Every so often, lightning will randomly strike and regenerate some of your lost health. I didn't realize this and assumed the lightning was an enemy, so I actively tried to avoid it. Maybe the instructions should have mentioned something about that. When you see lightning strike, is your first instinct to run headfirst into it? At the end of each stage, you find a treasure chest that gives you a new power. You can dash and double jump after completing the first two stages. You can use this double jump to skip over whole parts of the stage. For the most part, this game is straightforward, but some parts of it can get a little challenging. These flying jack-o'-lantern enemies can be hard to hit, and these... things will instantly kill you if you touch them. You only start with three lives, and new ones are really hard to find. What are they anyway? Spiked sushi rolls? Can't be much more dangerous than gas station sushi. After the third stage, you reach a boss fight. Gary has mutated into a giant monster and you have to turn him back to normal by absolutely demolishing him. I feel like this stage missed an opportunity because there are platforms that collapse when you walk on them, but leading Gary over to them doesn't do anything. This would have been a creative way to take out a boss. That aside, this fight is actually really hard. Gary takes a ridiculous amount of hits, even with the special move. His normal attacks are avoidable, but when he starts dropping rocks on you, it's really hard to avoid them. They drop so frequently, and they aim for you specifically, so you have to keep moving and can't keep attacking Gary. It's very easy to die, and when you do, you have to start from the very beginning of the first stage all over again. Don't you think those stakes are a little high for how stingy the game is with giving you extra lives? I wasn't sure why the fight was so hard, because I assumed it was only the first boss. But when I beat him, I realized he was actually the only boss. The game ends after you turn Gary back to normal. I honestly expected it to be longer than that. I guess that explains why the boss is such a pain in the neck, so I have to forgive it. Not bad, but the sequel is a direct continuation, so let's see how it holds up. In this, you get to keep your dash and double jump abilities. Still, it's much harder than the first one. These Audrey 2 shark hybrids are a real pain to jump over and they shoot at you from afar. There are also far more killer sushi rolls than there were in the first game. In this one section, you have to time your jumps perfectly or the game will just outright drain all your health. This segment is way too easy to die in for how rare extra lives are. The entire time I was playing through this, I was super paranoid because of how hard the boss was in the first game. I wanted to save as many lives as I possibly could, so this really put a nail in my plans. Speaking of nails, this game gives you a new special ability where you can plant an explosive nail as a mine. It's highly impractical since the plant enemies don't move and most of the other enemies fly. You can also dash in the air, which is useful, but what you might not be prepared for is the segment toward the end of the third round where you have to jump on these platforms. If you fall, it's an instant death, so you just might lose it all right before facing the final boss. When you reach him, you find out Plankton is the one behind all this, and you get ready for a fight. Not going to lie, the final boss looks amazing. Like a robot Dracula fish of some kind. Obviously, this really hard sequel is going to have a boss fight that's infinitely harder than the one before it. So we better prepare ourselves for- oh, we beat it already. Okay then. Yeah, the boss is a big pushover in this one. I think the hardness of the stages themselves compensate for it, so I don't mind having an easy fight at the end. It's kind of strange how you only save one of your friends before facing the final boss. I wonder if they wanted to make this a bigger series and just didn't have the time or budget for it. For a basic platformer, it's fine and worth giving a shot if you like Spongebob games. So if you find yourself wanting more of Frankenbob, there's a fan game called Frankenbob Night that was made on the website Mixie Games. I guess Frankenbob developed a following of his own. Such a deep character with a compelling narrative. The game is really easy, but still fun. You cover enemies such as these giant killer potatoes in dirt, then you hit them and send them rolling across the screen to destroy more enemies. It's a nice time killer and kind of fun to play. The enemy choices are strange though. These white fuzzballs, literal dogs just walking around, this green thing, and a giant enemy clown that acts as a boss. Still, not a bad game. Next up is a popular one called Boo or Boom. I assume that's a parody of Trick or Treat. 
Basically, it's a SpongeBob version of Bomberman, a classic game series. This was also developed by Sarbakken, so they had plenty of experience with adapting existing games. According to the story, Plankton is blocking the streets of Bikini Bottom with giant jack-o'-lanterns because he hates Halloween. Makes sense to me. So you take control of either SpongeBob, Patrick, Sandy, or Squidward, and you go around blowing up the Planko-lanterns. Not with traditional bombs, mind you, but with plumsters. I have absolutely no idea what those are. They don't even look like plums, but I guess onion stirs didn't sound as natural. Apart from blowing up the Planko lanterns, you have to color the tiles of the board with your character's color. You do this by setting off bombs in various spaces so the explosions paint the tiles with your color. The downside is, if you get caught in a bomb blast, you lose all your progress and have to start coloring all over again. Apparently the fate of Bikini Bottom lies on you alone, because if you lose, the game says Plankton won. If that's the case, why don't the other characters just let you win? Aren't we all after the same goal here? At the end, Plankton is touched by the Halloween spirit and enjoys the holiday after all. I can't imagine his plan was too threatening, though. The good guys probably did more damage by blowing everything up than he did by just putting jack-o'-lanterns everywhere. I guess the main characters were just having a big ego fight to see who could blow up enough of the town so it would match their favorite color. That explains why your friends won't let you win even though you're the only one who can stop Plankton. But even if it is just a Bomberman clone, this game is good. It's worth playing, and I can see why children found it so addicting. But we still haven't answered the ultimate question. Boo or boom? Truly a conundrum for even the wisest of us all. Now let's take a break from Sarbakken and look at a different developer. Gonzo Games was an indie company that made a good few Spongebob games of their own. I never expected Gonzo to take an interest in game development, but maybe he has some hidden talents we don't know about. They also made a lot of poker and casino games. I always had my suspicions about Gonzo's gambling addiction. Never meet your heroes. This first game of theirs is called Fang In There. Ah, that one hurts. You're Spongebob, and you're being joyously chased by a vampire Patrick in a constantly moving platformer. You have to jump up and down to switch to different platforms as obstacles appear for you to jump over. If you die, Patrick gives this creepy laugh. <laughs> a more complicated Gonzo game is Zombie Breakout. Now this one is just downright terrifying. You can recognize Gonzo Spongebob games based on their distinctive black and white old film-like style, which really suits the games they make. This one is really dark because you're actually trying to save your friends from zombies. Not zombies obsessed with Krabby Patties, actual killer zombies. Covered in blood. Or maybe condiments, they are different shades after all. You shoot the zombies while moving across this map in an overhead view as you try to find characters from the show to save them. It took me far too long to realize they were marked on the mini-map in the corner. You also use jellyfish as ammo. Hey, it probably works. This game is enjoyable, but still really creepy in concept. But an even creepier Gonzo game would be Frank and Patrick. I guess Frank and Bob needed a friend. We really need to expand his lore. In this one, you have a Patrick monster up above and you need to connect gears so they spin in a coherent pattern. Aside from Patrick being at the top of the screen, this game has nothing to do with Spongebob. It's a basic puzzle game, so let's move on. Another Gonzo game worth looking into is Ghoul Getter. This one actually has some color because Spongebob glows bright green. You're a ghostly Spongebob and you have to fly higher by hitting clouds to increase altitude. If you fall, it's game over. It's really fun, I like this one. It reminds me of a dream I once had. A long time ago, I dreamed of a Spongebob episode where Spongebob and Patrick upset the Flying Dutchman. As punishment, he turned them into ghosts. They enjoyed it at first, but life as a ghost proved difficult, so they went back to the Flying Dutchman and begged to be turned back to normal. Now imagine my surprise years later when an actual episode came out with this exact premise. Did I have a premonition or something? Keeping with the Halloween spirit, that's got to be one of the spookiest things that has ever happened to me. So yeah, the game's good. The last Gonzo game is Plunder Blunder, where you're chasing a ghost pirate who's eating pizza. There are a bunch of other pirates behind you that you can shoot at. It's similar to Fang in there, but with an even stranger concept. It's alright. Now let's pay a visit to an old company we have some fond memories with. Remember This Is Pop? The ones that gave us the amazing Fire Emblem Spongebob edition in the form of Atlantis Square Pantis Square Off? I still consider it one of the greatest Spongebob computer games, so I have high expectations for what Flash games they can contribute. 
In Ghost Slayer, you're in a knight's helmet for some reason, and you have to collect candy corn while throwing bubbles at ghosts. There isn't really anything to this game, but when you lose, Spongebob gives you a personally signed certificate thanking you for playing a 10-year anniversary Nickelodeon game. Lackluster as this game is, it's worth playing just for Spongebob to personally thank you. I feel so appreciated. This is Pop also made Dastardly Dirty Treats, a game where you face off against the dirty bubble by... throwing candy at him. Very Halloween, I applaud your decision. He shoots smaller bubbles at you, but keeping with the Halloween spirit, let's say they're giant whoppers. Or those big chocolate balls with little candies inside. Remember those? I miss them. Bring them back. So it's just a straightforward platform fighting game. It's simple, but decent. This is Pop still has a clean record as far as I'm concerned. Now for our last game, let's take a look at one by Workin' Man. Previously, we checked out their take on the Clash of Triton game. I thought it was pretty good. This one's called SpongeBob's Gone Missing. I wonder if it's anything like Mario is missing. Do we have a Patrick equivalent of Ouija in this? You take control of Patrick as he tries to find Spongebob at a Halloween party on the Flying Dutchman's ship. Nearly every character from the show is in attendance, but the ship is filled with ghosts trying to attack you. You scare them off by shining your flashlight at them. At the start, you can enter a code to permanently scare ghosts off with your light so they don't come back afterwards. You go around the ship jumping on platforms and collecting coins for points. Some of the characters in the background can have disproportionate sizes, but I like the shaded animation in this. It gives the game a nice look. It's really easy. You just jump around and scare ghosts until you reach SpongeBob at the end of the stage. But it always turns out to be a different character in a SpongeBob costume. What lengths did they have to go to to convince Squidward to dress up like SpongeBob? After the first stage, the gist of the game becomes obvious. You jump on platforms, scare ghosts, and find a fake SpongeBob who turns out to be one of your other friends. The game is fun, but it goes on for a tad too long. I don't see why there had to be so many stages when the levels aren't all that different. I just think they wanted to have as many Spongebob characters in it as they possibly could. One thing that's weird about this is how the ghosts only seem to attack you and nobody else seems aware of their existence. What did Patrick do to make all the ghosts angry with him in particular? So after searching the entire ship, you find the Flying Dutchman at the top of it. You fight him in the same way you did with the other ghosts. He throws ghostly skulls at you, but he's really easy. Once you defeat him, you've probably predicted the twist by now, but he turns out to be Spongebob in disguise. Gee, thanks for attacking me like that. Where did Spongebob get all those skulls anyway? Did he keep souvenirs after his Whirlybird incident? So everyone parties until the Flying Dutchman shows up and kicks you all off his ship. And that concludes Spongebob's Gone Missing. A pretty good game with a decent concept. Maybe it should have been a little shorter, but it's fine. Overall, these games are decent ways to spend time, and children could find them amusing. Even the more simple ones can be enjoyable. Sarbakin, This Is Pop, Gonzo Games, Mixie, Workin' Man, you did alright. But remember, October is just getting started. I'd say this month is off to a good start for us. Stick around and we'll see what other games await us around the corner. Thank you for joining me, I will see you in the next memory.